doing and now continuing to do. So I wanted to lay that out for you because a lot of people think of Sherfu as a great cultivator, as a Trupitakan Chan master, uh, which he certainly was, there's no doubt about it. But sometimes the heart of education that was in his person uh, is lost. And I wanted to stress that a bit today in the time I have. Sherfu was born in 1918 in Manchuria, Dungay, uh, and he was the youngest of 10 children, came from a large family. Uh, he only was able to attend school for two years, given the poverty and the lack of education available. But he still used that time to study all the Chinese classics and committed much of them to memory. And even when he was young, he opened a free school in his area for people to come to, for both children and adults. And then for 10 years, he devoted himself to studying the Buddhist scriptures in both the esoteric and the Chan schools. And he also read, and this is interesting, and contemplated and went off much time and energy pushing, promoting, supporting, starting education. Let me offer some speculation, but it's also based on spending time with him and getting a feel for why he was doing this. The major reason is that Buddhism, by its very nature, is education. Buddhism is an educational teaching. And you learn Buddhism through asking questions, through discovery, through experimentation, through a back and forth dialogue between teachers and students, between text and students. The Buddha's own experience replicates this. He starts with a question, he goes forth, and he goes from teacher to teacher to teacher, learning. In the Avatamsaka Sutra, we have one chapter devoted to education called the Gandhavila. And in that chapter, this young good wealth goes through 50 or more teachers in search for an understanding of the truth. It's a model for all of us. And I think the reason why it's a teaching is because it has to be drawn out of us. The essence of Buddhism says that wisdom, compassion, enlightenment, bodhi, are innate, they're intrinsic. But they have to be drawn out of us. They have to be elicited. And that actually is the word in education in English, the Latin educere, means to, to draw out from within that which is latent. So all the language of Buddhism, enlightening, lighting up the mind, seeing the nature, all describe a learning educational process. That's why the Buddha called himself a teacher. And that's why Shurfa called himself a teacher. And we know this, if you look at the Dhammapada, a very famous passage, excuse my poetic translation. It wasn't just education for lay people that Shurfa was talking about. He was. But he wanted the university to also be a university for Sangha. And this is something that took me a while to understand. I'll give you a brief story to illustrate this. We were traveling in Asia in 1977, and Sherpa would take us to see the new temples uh, that were going up. And we went to one particular temple that was very lavish. It had imported marble from Italy, gilded Buddha statues 30 to 50 feet high, Incense urns about half the size of this hall. Um, great, spacious ceilings. And we went in, I was overwhelmed. And afterwards, Shifu said, well, Gorteng, what do you think? I said, oh, Shifu, really, really adorned, really awesome. And he said, yeah, well, it's missing. I said, Shifu. He says, what's missing? I said, I don't know. He says, there's no classrooms. There's no place for instruction. Where do people study and learn? He said, don't you realize that this is why Buddhism in Asia has declined so much? You cannot allow this to happen in the United States. All my way places have to be classrooms, places for lecture. Even if it's turning the bowing cushions and sitting on them, there has to be lecture, discussion, translation. There has to be learning. So, based on that, Sherpa felt and I'll give you his closing statement, he said, therefore, in the United States, I'm going to make it a requirement that everybody who ordains under me has at least a bachelor's degree. He said, do a good job of training people and teaching students. You can organize and run the schools well. The elementary school should be run well. 
the secondary school should be run, well, a little bit better. <laughs> and the university should be run well even more, exclamation point. Educating and training people is extremely important. You should not just care about yourself. So that's the sort of larger scope, I think, as I understood it, of sure the vision of education. Um, and then we're going to have a whole series of people. And I went over my time. <laughs> so much time and energy pushing, promoting, supporting, starting education. Let me offer some speculation, but it's also based on spending time with him and getting a feel for why he was doing this. The major reason is that Buddhism, by its very nature, is education. Buddhism is an educational teaching. And you learn Buddhism through asking questions, through discovery, through experimentation, through a back and forth dialogue between teachers and students, between text and students. The Buddha's own experience replicates this. He starts with a question, he goes forth, and he goes from teacher to teacher to teacher, learning. In the Avatamsaka Sutra, we have one chapter devoted to education called the Gandhanila. And in that chapter, this young good wealth goes through 50 or more teachers in search for an understanding of the truth. It's a model for all of us. And I think the reason why it's a teaching is because it has to be drawn out of us. The essence of Buddhism says that wisdom, compassion, enlightenment, Bodhi, are innate, they're intrinsic, but they have to be drawn out of us. They have to be elicited. And that actually is the word in education in English, the Latin educere means to, to draw out from within that which is latent. So all the language of Buddhism, enlightening, lightening up the mind, seeing the nature, all describe a learning educational process. That's why the Buddha called himself a teacher. And that's why Shurfa called himself a teacher. And we know this if you look at the Dhammapada, a very famous passage, excuse my poetic translation.